e, e partiamo e diciamo dear friends of the Dante Alighieri Society obviously good evening and possibly we also say good morning to our Italian friends and welcome to our online conference but before our proceeding is it is as it is customary on behalf of the Dante Alighieri Society I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation the custodian of the land and recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and their culture. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. This evening, on the occasion of the fifth centenary of his death, we pay homage to Raffaello Sanzio, or Raphael, as it is better known in the English-speaking world. To celebrate Raphael Law, we have tonight Sharon Toffler, who is a visual arts educator at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Sharon was a secondary school <clears throat> visual art teacher for nearly 40 years. She holds a master degree in art history and film theory from the University of Sydney. Sharon has been involved in the development of the New South Wales visual arts syllabus for secondary school and in setting the marketing, sorry, the marking New South Wales HEC visual arts exams. So, Sharon is eminently qualified to speak to us about the art of Raffaello, about the artist's idea of beauty and about the emotions that beauty generates in us, the viewers, who have the opportunity to admire his masterpieces, be they Pope or gentleman portraits, the beautiful Madonna and altar pieces and many others. But it's enough for me. And, uh, and Sharon will illustrate all this much better than I can so, with many thanks, I give the word to Sharon and wish you all what has called. Thank you, Fabio, for that very nice. Sharon? Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, good. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming and for putting up with my wonderful Italian. Of course, it will all be in English. I hope you have a fabulous glass of Sangiovese next to you. I would if I could, but I'd be asleep. Um, and I hope you enjoy this journey. It's an honour to be presenting to you all and um, to celebrate Raphael's 500th year is quite extraordinary. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint now. So just please make sure you can see it and let me know if you can't. Is that all clear? Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes? <laughs> okay. Yes, no problem. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a work that, of course, most of you would recognise Dante right in the centre, but actually I'm not going to look at this painting because I'm sure it's a painting you all know very well. The uh, fresco in the Stanza della Signatura, extraordinary painting, the School of Athens. It's really what he's um, most well known for, but Raphael was an extraordinary artist who painted hundreds and hundreds of paintings in his very short life. I want to really start somewhere where maybe you don't expect with this image. So this is actually a small, really exquisite carved limestone sculpture of a woman that was discovered in Willendorf in Austria about 90 odd years ago. And it was discovered by archeologists. And when they discovered it, they were quite surprised at what they were looking at. She's only 11 centimeters in height. So she actually can sit in the palm of your hand and she was meant for carrying. She doesn't have feet uh, and it's not that they were broken off. She's actually meant for carrying. She's got these very large breasts, which I'm sure is probably the first thing everybody notices. Her large stomach, enlarged thighs and hips and bottom, we can see from the back. Um, from the front, we can see her arms are resting gently across her breasts. And she doesn't have any facial features, but her hair has been carved beautifully um, with kind of the, the hairstyle of plaits that have been braided and wrapped around her head. And really, this was what was regarded 
in possibly 30,000 BCE as a sign of beauty. A woman who was fertile, so she's almost a fertility figure, we think. Um, she was fertile, therein lies these enlarged sort of features that she was probably pregnant and fertile. And it was really regarded as a sign of beauty. There have been about another 144 of these images discovered since that one in both Europe and Asia. And they are all different. Some of them are so tiny and skinny that you wouldn't know that they had breasts, that the pubic area is hardly defined. So it's kind of interesting how our uh, vision of beauty and our concept of beauty over the period of time changes um, according to the philosophy, the thinking, the understanding um, and our intellectual surroundings. Okay, somehow I've lost my PowerPoint. Um, so this is now 21st century idea of beauty. This idea of, again, these enlarged breasts, the tiny waist, the huge hips, and of course, this, for many of you will know, is the, I don't know what she is, <laughs> popular character, Kim Kardashian. And I thought it was kind of interesting that um, we can criticise it, we can judge it, and yet, in fact, in 2019, her, she herself was worth $100 million. And if we compare it to the Venus of Willendorf, um, now known as the woman of Willendorf, there's not much difference really between the two. So it's kind of interesting how our concepts and ideas of beauty change and develop over the time. Uh, sorry, somehow or other it's not happy. So Raphael, let's have a look at where he is. Now this is a beautiful portrait. His career was short, but he was extraordinary extraordinary in what he accomplished. He produced works of a religious nature. He produced extraordinary history paintings. So with multiple, multiple figures, sometimes 50, 60, 70 figures in a painting, he became known as a fabulous portrait painter uh, for really the upper class and of course the popes. He was famous for his wall decorations, his frescoes. He produced many, many outstanding, extraordinary tapestries. He was fascinated with architecture and uh, actually did some buildings of his own. He became a curator and archivist. He was put in charge of all the ancient Roman and Greek discoveries that were being made in Rome at the time uh, to document it, to curate it and to archive it. And he was also a printmaker. He had in really embraced any new technology that came about, any new knowledge that came about. He loved, he was passionate about it. He was excited by it and he embraced it. He came from a medieval hilltop town or city called Urbino, um, which was, um, I'm sure many of you've been up here in Northern Italy, which was, um, really an extraordinary place to be born. It was a centre that was um, run by Federico de Montefeltro. He, he was a diplomat, he was a patron of the arts, he was an educated man, educated in literature. He was an extraordinary patron of the arts and he commissioned such people as Paolo Uccello, Piero della Francesca, Luca Signorelli, and of course, Giovanni Santi, who in fact was Raphael's father. His court was regarded extremely highly. Um, it was a court where uh, people were respected. They were regarded as gentlemen, as intellectuals, as educated people. So it was really an extraordinary place. Inside his palace, was this small studio law and a huge library that was absolutely full of books. All the books that Federico Montefeltro collected were handwritten books that were inscribed on um, vellum 
although paper was invented and paper was quite um, ubiquitous at the time, Montefeltro wasn't interested in collecting anything on paper. He was suspicious of paper and suspicious of the fact that paper would even survive. So his library was full of these handmade, beautiful books in Greek, in Latin, in Hebrew. And the thing that he did, he was a visionary, is he opened his library up to the general public. People were invited to come in and read the books any time of the day. It was in daylight hours, Monday to Friday. So extraordinary um, access to materials of learning. And it was encouraged in Urbino. This is actually one of the earliest paintings we have of, oh, it's not a painting, a drawing, that Raphael did a self-portrait when he was about 17 years of age. It's the most delicate, sensitive little drawing. And I just want you to take note of it for a moment. I'm not gonna kind of analyze every work that we do, but I just think it's important to understand what really Raphael was doing at such a young age. He had a touch with his pencil or his chalk in this case, that was a very light touch. He understood that to engage an audience and to get them to interact in your work, what you needed to do was leave some of the aspects of your drawing undone. So the brain completes the rest of it. So in fact, he's done this extraordinary detail in the eyes, which Dante says the eyes and the mouth were the soul of, of the human being. This beautiful, heavy chalk that gives us weight to the profile of his face. The gorgeous hatch, cross hatching and delicacy around the planes of his face. And yet then we get it just absolutely disappearing. The same with the hair. We know what the hair looks like, but he doesn't give us all the detail. We're allowed to fill it in for ourselves. We're allowed to participate within this drawing that he's produced. Um, and if you look at his personality, it's a very delicate, sensitive, yet intelligent young man. Those eyes aren't empty. They're not vacant. They're full of curiosity. They're full of empathy. They're full of emotion. And really, that's what Raphael was like as a human being. He was a networker. He knew, just like today, if you want to get somewhere, you have to open up. His networks were familial. He had lots of connections within his family that supported him and helped him. And he really uh, encouraged those connections. He had an extraordinary artistic network of um, people that he knew and people that he admired and had never met. And he had an extraordinary intellectual network. And as I had just mentioned previously, even beginning from where he was born in this and access to such a library. Let's have a look at his familial influences. This is his home. It was quite a um, gentleman's home. The Gio Giovanni Santi was quite an accomplished, well-off man. He uh, had a painting workshop of his own. Um, he was an intellectual. He was a gentleman. He was a courtier. Uh, he had connections with popes. And he had made a decision along with his wife that his children, their children would not be wet nursed. In fact, that his wife would nurse the children himself, herself, would breastfeed the children, that they themselves would educate their children. And Giovanni had made a statement that there was no peasant, an uncouth peasant was going to educate their children. So in a way, he was like a bit of a hippie. He was quite innovative in the way he had decided to bring up his children. And in this really affected Raphael also for the rest of his life, the connections he had with his mother um, and his siblings, which I'll talk about in a moment. And this fresco is actually in their home. It's on the wall in the home. And it's believed to be predominantly the work of Raphael under his father's tutelage and that Raphael had worked on this uh, fresco at about the age of eight. So Giovanni had taken his son into his workshop 
from a very young age, at four and five, he was mixing pigments. He was working as, as really Giovanni's assistant. He was extremely talented and his father already became aware of his talents at a very young age and encouraged it. Giovanni Santi, so the father, this is one of his paintings, which I thought was kind of interesting to have a look at. And um, Vasari, so Giorgio Vasari, the um, Renaissance artist and writer who wrote the famous lives of the artists. Um, and I, I might add, just to get this in a bit of a sequence, he wrote this book over 30 years after Raphael had died. But Giovanni, um, sorry, Vasari says of Santi, he says, he's no great talent, but a truly good intellect. I don't know, it's not a bad painting, but let's have a look at Vasari's judgment. So we have Madonna and child. Um, Madonna is standing in a loggia. The child is kind of on a parapet in a way. Behind them is um, a window with this view of the outside world. But let's look at his strengths and look at his weaknesses. So during the Renaissance period and very early in the Renaissance period, the idea was to really convey a sense of harmony, of balance, of unity. And Santi in this painting almost breaks away with this just slightly by placing the Madonna on an angle and a diagonal and the baby is also placed on this diagonal. However, the baby's really very precariously sitting on that parapet and it's um, a bit concerning as a, as a mother to see this child kind of placed on this beautiful red cushion but awkwardly in a way on this parapet. If we look outside at the landscape, it's a very strange landscape. This mountain on the left-hand side of the uh, window is such a strange mountain. In fact, it's placed in such an odd, awkward manner that it almost feels as though it's abutting the property, the lodger, the balcony in which they're standing. It's, it's a very odd landscape. Let's have a look closer at the baby. Um, I don't know, considering Giovanni had children, I suspect he didn't look very carefully at what babies really look like. But remember, he was representing a divine, a holy child. Um, and this child is very still, very calm, on a diagonal, as I mentioned before, but he's very wooden looking. Even this arm looks like it's been carved out of wood. It looks like almost a toy puppet carved out of wood. Um, he wears a coral necklace that's a symbol of blood, of the passion to come. So the symbols are there um, and, and we do see Madonna supporting the head of the child and really touching his leg. But it, there's something quite awkward about it. What is beautifully done is this sacred cloth that hangs in the back. Uh, the cloth's obviously been folded. So we can still see in the folds that exist in the fabric and to paint that's quite extraordinary. And the beautiful details of the silk tapestry woven into this sacred cloth. So maybe Vasari's right in a way, maybe um, there are some attributes that Giovanni Santi had that he could definitely teach his young son. I want to now have a look at the intellectual and artistic influences. Um, Cennina Cennini was also a Renaissance artist who wrote a very famous book, The Book of Art, which was really like an instruction book for artists. So if you wanted to become an artist, this is a book that you studied. It had extraordinary detail of methods of mixing pigments, methods of applying gesso, making your gesso and mixing your gesso and applying it to um, panel. So gesso is like a, uh, it's like a limestone, like a plaster that's ground down very finely, that's laid across timber to give the surface for your painting, a surface for the paint to sort of attach itself to. But it takes quite a lot of preparation to make it act to make it secure. Um, and Cennino Cennini kind of went on to talk about um, how to make a fresco, how to paint a 
the panel how to, all sorts of things that an artist needs to know, but also how to behave. So really, as an artist, you should subscribe to drinking small amounts of alcohol and getting lots of sleep. So they were the sorts of things that he was dictating in his book. And it became almost like the Bible for artists. And here he even talks about how, this is just a little example, you know, you, you, you're to begin as a shop boy if you want to come, become an artist. Um, you're to study for one year. And really that study means you just watch, you don't do anything for the first year. You learn under some master. Uh, you have to learn how to do all those things that I just spoke about. You have to study for a good six years. And then once you've studied for a good six years, you have to work for another six years under a master before you even can begin as an artist. But all the time, you have to continue to draw. You must never stop drawing, not even on your holidays. So it's quite a kind of strict regime to become an artist. And Raphael really had this kind of worth, work ethic embedded in him. Um, at a very young age, when Giovanni, Giovanni Santi saw that Raphael had um, some, a lot of talent, he had decided that he needed to find his son somewhere to go to study, that he really couldn't teach his son anymore. And so he organised for his son to, his son to become an apprentice in the workshop of Pietro Perugino, which was in Perugia. Um, at this stage, this arrangement was made at around eight years of age. And um, Raphael's mother was devastated that her son was going to move away and study in Perugia at this workshop, which was a little distance away. And you've got to remember that this relationship now that the mother had with the son was very intimate and close bond after the breastfeeding and the education. Uh, Raphael was delighted with this. Um, a, a position to be able to work in this workshop and this appointment and that Perugino would accept him. And, um, but before he left, his mother died. So his mother died, in fact, when he was eight years of age. He had already lost a brother when he was two years of age. It's un we're unclear as to whether the brother was younger or older than him. We haven't got records about that, but we know he lost a brother when Raphael himself was two. And then three weeks after his mother died, his little sister died. So he was met with a lot of tragedy. He moved to Perugino's workshop, and just after he moved to the workshop, Giovanni Santi also died. So Raphael had hit a lot of tragedies by the time he arrived in the workshop of Pietro Perugino. We have a document that shows the very, very first commission that, well, that we have a document of that Raphael was given and it was in the workshop of Perugino and it was for this altarpiece um, of the coronation of Nicholas of Tolentino. Um, it was for the Baronchi Chapel in, um, Città di Castella, and in fact, the person who got the contract was one of the older masters in Perugino's workshop, but the older artist was not referred to as much as Raphael was, and Raphael was referred to as master, maestro, in this contract, and he was only 17 years of age. This small little face here in the distance that you can see, not very well, it has in fact been proven to be totally by Raphael's hand. The work no longer exists, it was damaged severely in an earthquake, but we do have segments and little segments that exist and this is the fragment that Raphael uh, had painted that still exists today, it's in Brescia. So it's an extraordinary painting for a 17 year old. Again, the amazing delicacy of this face. The movement that he gets of this angel as the hair gently, but in a really divine, heavenly way, delicately floats away. The fabric that twists around the body of the angel and the um, coat that almost kind of folds back. So revealing this kind of movement. And I really think that Raphael is using, which he did do in his life, his own knowledge of his own studies of portraits that he did of himself and of others to inform his practice. 
Around this time also, we have these extraordinary discoveries, these discoveries of ancient antiquity, ancient Greek, ancient Roman sculptures, uh, pieces of architecture, documents that had been found. And as I had said earlier, Raphael loved finding anything new. Anything that was new, he couldn't get enough of. And we've also got at this time this whole concept of humanism, this new intellectual movement in Italy, this idea of um, aiming for perfection and yet that the human being has some role in this space. Um, so this sort of influence uh, Raphael was reading about, Raphael was watching these discoveries, uh, Drawings were being disseminated on paper, which was really uh, had come to Italy via Asia. But in fact, um, Fabriano, which is up near Obino, was one of the amazing centres for making paper because the water flowed so fast. It, it was more efficient paper making centre than anywhere in Asia. So paper was uh, fairly ubiquitous at this stage and Raphael was seeing these sketches on paper even though, and he was travelling a little bit as well. So he was really being informed as to what was going on um, it, with these new archaeological finds. And then we get Piero della Francesca producing this um, concept of how to build an ideal city. So here we have a very long panoramic view of a, and a centrally composed painting with this small temple, this perfectly round, so the circle becomes really a symbol of perfection, a symbol of the divine, right in the centre of the composition. And on either side, this small temple is flanked by really contemporary, this is now really contemporary ideas of Renaissance architecture facades. I mean, now we look at them as these beautiful old facades, but these were really contemporary. This is an artist who's coming up with ideas for an ideal city. And of course, we know that mathematics was being um, looked at again, Vitruvius was being studied, and this whole um, theory of perspective was being developed by many artists. A lot of people say it's only Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, but it, that it was not correct. There are many artists who were working with um, the linear perspective to develop a sense of depth and space. Um, this little doorway, we'll see how it changes as it goes on. And these are architects are doing today. So architects are still drawing the ideal city. How do we cope with traffic? How do we cope with our lack of space? How do we grow our vegetation? Um, there are architects who are working on these things today. Okay, let's move back to Perugino. Raphael learned a lot from Perugino. And as Cennino Cennini had said, if you want to become a perfect mar uh, artist, you must copy your master. And he learnt a lot from Perugino, he copied Perugino. This is Perugino's marriage of the Virgin. We've got the temple, we've got the piazza, we've got the perspective, we've got the doorway, we've got the marriage occurring, the high priest directly in the vertical, a very symmetrical still composition. The figures are flat and really horizontal on a band. Um, there is some interaction, but of, of some description, but then we get Bramante's doing his sketches of, um, again, not only an ideal city, but the Tempietto that of course he's about to construct, this perfect little temple um, at, the, at the spot where St. Peter was crucified. And the idea was that the, door, the doorway would stay open and through it you would see the spot in which St Peter was crucified. And then Raphael does his version of the same painting, but he's influenced much more by Bramante's temple, so it's much more circular and rounded. He changes the depth from, and I'll bring it down for you so you can compare them, of Perugino's. He uses the perspective to create much more depth. The temple is raised much more towards heaven. There's another world out here that we access and to allow us to get into that scene, what he does with the high priest who's performing the marriage between these figures is he tilts the head slightly, allowing us as the audience to 
access the actual marriage ceremony and to head to an, the other space, where, which is our aim. And Raphael does something also really different from his master. He creates much more animation. He brings the figures much more forward and makes them larger than what happens in the Perugino work. And the figures start performing almost like a stage setting on a, on a theatre. So you can see the arc that's made by the feet, which is repeating the ellipses of the perspective in the arcs of the temple. And he does the same with the tips of the heads. So he's really constructing his compositions in a way that's responding to the new innovations that are occurring around him. Um, just kind of out of interest, which many of you probably know, the, the suitors who've come to try and hopefully marry the Virgin are all carrying these rods. But she selects the suitor whose rod flowers. You can probably see it more clearly in this one. I'll show you a close up in a moment. And Joseph Rod's, Rod's flowers. Oh. And the other suitors who lost the role as, as the groom, take their rods and you can see what Raphael does with this sense of drama. He brings this suitor who's lost the, the, the fight, <laughs> the competition, who snaps his rod against his knee right in the foreground in bright red with green, these contrasting colours in the foreground to, to kind of heighten this drama and this extraordinary the angle of the suitor. Anatomy on the arms and yes. Well, she looks pregnant and her neck too is more realistic in this one. Correct. Yeah. And and that this thing of her looking pregnant, I have to say, was often um, an ancient Jewish tradition from the Old Testament that in fact, if women couldn't become fertile and couldn't produce a baby, that, that they, they wouldn't, you couldn't marry them. <laughs> so, so it's kind of interesting. But here it could also, of course, be predicting the birth. Um, so it's quite a kind of interesting innovation of the, the Perugino version to the Raphael version. And this is what he does. He just learns from the masters and takes it further. The next huge influence in Perugino's life was this courtier, and his name is Baldessare Castiglioni. And Castiglioni um, was really uh, a, a friend of Raphael's. He was only five years older than Raphael. He was also from Urbino, so they knew each other very well. He was really responsible for uh, the court of Montefeltro being regarded as kind of one of the most intellectual and um, powerful and established courts um, of the time. And he is also famous for writing a book called The Book of the Courtier, um, which in fact was so popular that over 180, um, 180 or 108, no, I'm sorry, 108 editions were rewritten and republished during his time. It was such a popular book. And it was how to behave, this new thinking on how to behave as a gentleman, um, how to behave as a pious Christian gentleman. And it wasn't just about gentlemen, it was about women too. That women were equal to men, that women had a right to an education, and that the um, courtier and the uh, intellectual gentleman of the Renaissance would also have his daughters educated as equally as his sons educated. So it, it, it was about manners, it was about dress, it was about um, how you treated others. And I just want to look at this painting that Raphael did of his friend. He did this mu mu much later, but I want to look at it in detail. One of the things that Castiglioni really uh, developed with, was this kind of concept of sprezzatura, this uh, concept that um, you need to be a gentleman, you need to be an intellectual, you need to be of a high class, but you mustn't look down on other people. You must treat people equally. You must be humble in your intellectual acknowledgements and in your achievements you know, as a 
businessman or as whatever you were, whatever you had achieved, you must be humble. And also this idea of, with this Spritzer tour, this idea of um, you could show your all your qualities, but in a very casual and a relaxed kind of a way, a bit of a... Um, a bit of a laissez-faire way, uh, probably not the way we think of it in contemporary time terms, but uh, in, a, in a humble way, but in a relaxed way. So you weren't to look down on others. And Raphael has done this in this portrait. So this portrait of Castiglione with these eyes that stare straight at us. I mean, we can't help but, as Dante says, look at his soul through his eyes and his mouth. He says it was the opening to the soul. You, we almost can't help but keep staring at his eyes. But his eyes are eyes, if I saw this man in the street, I'd be thinking, oh, that's a, he's a man of intellect, but he's also a man of gentleness, of empathy, of warmth. You feel like you would feel comfortable in his company. He's not superior in any way. And Raphael's captured all of that in his personality. Um, you know, he's used paint to show this beautiful dryness of the beard. You feel like if you rubbed your hands on this beard, you'd feel the dryness of the whiskers. He's used paint to show this extraordinary velvet in this courtier's cap that he wears. He's used the same paint, it's the same paint, to show the fur that he wears. And this beautiful uh, linen, fine, fine linen and silk fabric of the shirt and then this stunning light that hits the eyes in Castiglione's face. So Raphael was showing his skills at, well this is now his 30 years of age. Okay, we have to move along, sorry. <laughs> so um, of course now we hit the superstars. So it's kind of really interesting because Raphael was really lost in amongst these superstars throughout history. And it wasn't until John Shearman, um, an art historian, about 60 years ago, made a, made a decision and, and made a declaration almost through his research that these, this superstar and the other big superstar that of course you all know about, um, Really, Raphael bore the weight of these two men, and yet he stands up to them just as equally. But I want to talk to you a little bit about Leonardo so that you can understand the influence that he had over Raphael and where Raphael took off from him. So Leonardo was a um, really a, a, fanta a fantastic man in terms of his personality. He was gregarious, he loved people, he loved sharing knowledge, he was a good conversationalist. This really goes against what a lot of people say about him. Um, he um, was, of course, very well read. He was almost the Steve Jobs of the Renaissance period. He really was interested in how uh, science and beauty could be conveyed in one. And Steve Jobs, with all his inventions with Apple, did exactly that with this extraordinary technology with his iPhones and computers, but they also looked slick and beautiful. That's why they just hit the market and sold all over the world so quickly. And Leonardo and Steve Jobs had this same kind of brain. I'd love to have them to dinner together at a dinner party. Um, they were interested in... He was interested in everything, in uh, anatomy, in science, in astronomy, in geometry, you name it, mathematics, uh, physiognomy. He was interested in everything. He was a homosexual and he was proud of his homosexuality. He had a long-time lover, this young man called Saleh. Saleh was um, many, 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 many years younger than Leonardo. Um, he, Leonardo referred to him as the little devil. He was way beneath Leonardo's uh, class, if you want to have a class, even though Baldessari says you shouldn't have classes of people. He was a thief, he was uh, um, a mischief maker, and Leonardo used to refer to him as his little devil. Um, wherever Leonardo went, he went with a huge entourage of people, and uh, he wore a flamboyant, beautiful robes, 
dressed in bright red and um, really Kenneth Clark, the art critic, said the biggest tragedy of Leonardo is that he only produced about 15 paintings. The other thing about Leonardo that um, I'm going to bring up at this stage is that in fact he was really interested in his homosexuality and in Florence you could be homosexual. It was absolutely, Florence was the kind of contemporary New York of Renaissance Italy. In Florence, you could do anything and everything. It's like, you know, the Cary Grant of living in New York. You could live this homosexual life which Cary Grant did. But the minute you went to Hollywood, all of a sudden you had to pretend that you were um, heterosexual, Cary Grant had to pretend and get married. Leonardo could behave and, and feel free as a homosexual in Florence, but not in Rome. Rome had a different kind of a, um, a philosophy. And of course, being the centre of the Pope's seat was probably a big influence in that. Um, and, and Leonardo wrote this whole piece in his notebooks on the penis, how the penis has a mind of its own. It shouldn't be ignored. It's there to be shown. And of course, we know that his paintings had the penis shown everywhere and then later on it was covered up. Um, these are drawings that Raphael did after seeing drawings of Leonardo's. He was really motivated, encouraged by the kind of work he was seeing and influence that Leonardo did. And he went to, he was there, um, well, this is a Michelangelo reference, when uh, the David was unveiled. He's copying these um, works, he's, cop he's working from life, he's developing the musculature. He also did what the other two did in terms of uh, uh, dissecting bodies to understand how they worked, how the muscles worked, um, and he's doing these amazing drawings on, on paper. And of course, the next superstar we have is Michelangelo. This is not a self-portrait that, that Michelangelo did, but a copy of what they think is a portrait that Michelangelo did. So this is not actually by Michelangelo, but it is a copy. Um, uh, attributed to Volterra. So um, Michelangelo was the antithesis really in a way of Leonardo, or also a homosexual, but he was moody. He was um, a loner. He was melancholic. He was bad tempered. He was filthy. He didn't care about his clothes. He often slept in his workshop in his dirty work clothes. He didn't like being disturbed. He didn't want to be with people. He was intense. He was also intelligent. Um, he was a pious Christian and, and a homosexual who had um, really taken a vow of celibacy. Uh, he was tormented by his homosexuality. It, it really tormented him for his whole life. And he was insanely jealous. And he was only eight years older than Raphael. So he saw Raphael as this massive competitor. And he was insanely jealous of him. Raphael was not jealous of Michelangelo. He was in awe of him. He loved his genius and, and the things, the innovative things he was doing. But Michelangelo wanted to be the innovator. He didn't want anyone else to be the innovator. And he's quoted as saying that Raphael learned all he knows of art from me. In other words, he doesn't know anything. He just copied and copied me. Um, I just want to go back to this work for a moment to talk more about this idea of the ideal and of the, this intellectual and philosophical movement of humanism that was developing. That Raphael was still painting these works that were very tender, very human-like in a way, and yet still part of the divine. You know, this is not someone you would bump into on a street. She is divine. She is unattainable. She's of another world. She's not of our earth and of our world. But of course, this philosophy of the human being engendered with some sense of control that was enveloping this Renaissance thinking, Raphael was trying to put into his works. And we start seeing him in Florence now, moving to Florence, 
being inundated with small Madonna and child pieces. He didn't get any large commissions in Florence. He wasn't well enough known yet. He was still very young, but he was, but once he started doing these small devotional um, pieces, he was, he couldn't keep up with the work really, although he did, he, he had a huge work ethic. And here we have a, a kind of a Mary, a virgin, who's now got, she's still divine. We've got this beautiful sense of this face being of, an, of another world. And yet the connection she has with this child, if you think back to Raphael's father and how the virgin held the baby, this mother is holding this baby. This bottom is supporting this, this hand, sorry, supporting this baby's bottom. This toe that's wiggling and pushing off the hand of his mother. She's aware that he's trying to wriggle himself out of her arms to his future, to his destiny. Um, but she's grounded in this. And her clothes that Raphael has draped her with really are following her body. They're not like the Perugino's that were just almost um, uh, garments that just went over the body and disguised the body. Raphael has a huge understanding of the anatomy and how the body works underneath the clothing. And then we see, sorry, I'll show you these beautiful details. Extraordinary. And the little dimples in the skin of the flesh of the baby. This is a young artist who's really seen babies and seen children. And remember, his sister was born but died three weeks after his mother had died and his brother had died. So he's really been a, an observer of life. And this beautiful veil, this transparent piece of cloth that again moves. We saw very early in that angel that he did when he was 17. Um, he's going even further with his skills. And then portraiture. He was commissioned to do many portraits. This is not by him. It's a Piero della Francesca portrait of the Montefeltros of Urbino. And this is the classical portraiture that was done of the day. Um, profile, emotionless in a way. I mean, we could analyse some emotion if we wanted to, um, but it was to show their power. It was to show their ownership, this massive landscape that the Montefeltros, the, the territories that they had claimed, their, their accomplishments, their jewellery, the cloth. This, in fact, was a commission um, that was made by the Duke of Urbino really on the death of his wife. So it's really a death portrait, a double portrait that's a death portrait. But Raphael starts being employed to make these sorts of portraits. He's aware of the Mona Lisa, although the Mona Lisa at this stage is only just sort of being finished, if Mona Lisa was ever finished by Leonardo. Um, he starts turning the faces to face each other, the portraits, these um, three quarter, two thirds view. The bodies with the sprezzatura, relaxed and casual, resting on the parapet. Um, but this is a, a marriage um, portrait and you can really see that these two belong to each other. Raphael puts their hands forward with their rings and their rings show the red stone of commitment. Uh, um, Agnolo Don, Donny was a cloth merchant, a very wealthy cloth merchant. So Raphael pays particular attention to the beautiful fabrics and the jewellery and the cloth that we saw already in the Baldessari painting um, and, the, and the stunning silks and brocades that his wife Madalena wears with, of course, the jewellery. But look at that again, the ability to do these beautiful transparent shawls that's um, stitched with this beautiful lacing around the leg around the edge so he the, and the expression on this face we know this man we could meet him in the street we could invite him for a dinner party as well he we, you know he's real um he, we have a, a an empathy and a and some sort of connection with him but michelangelo the innovator as ever starts doing portraits in this round in this tondo which became also very popular so this is a portrait of course of the holy family but michelangelo does something that 
really Raphael rejects. His figures are powerful, they're strong, they're solid, they're muscular. Raphael takes that on, he's really interested in that. What he rejects is the way Michelangelo almost cuts his figures out. Michelangelo almost put an outline around all of his forms. And it's almost like the figures have been cut out and placed onto a background. It's like they've been photoshopped, cut out and photoshopped. There's a severity about them. It loses this softness. Whereas Leonardo had developed that technique called sfumato, where the edges blur and become smoky and soft because Leonardo believed that there was no such thing as a hard edge on a human figure. It doesn't exist or, or on anything in nature that it goes round it. And this fumato effect Raphael employs in the album Madonna, and I think you'd agree that this is such a softer, more gentle, more, in fact, real um, portrait, and yet we've still got this sense of divine. We, you know, we're not allowed to quite access her. She's planted firmly on the ground, and he puts in his classical knowledge of these ancient Roman, classical Roman sandals, these were not worn during the Renaissance period. He's bringing in all these innovations, these new discoveries into this brand new work. Um, but he also adopts this tondo that Michelangelo began with, and it becomes extremely popular. Um, but it's a very sensitive painting. You know, this young baby Christ is really sitting on the lap of his mother, but he knows his destinies. He's heading to St John the Baptist. He's taking the cross. He knows his responsibility. And she's looking ahead and allowing him to step forward. She has a finger in the, in the section of the book that talks about the passion and his future. And this one I just put in because it's my favourite and I can't resist. Um, so this is a um, Madonna of the chair. It's just talk about humanism. So this painting now is still in a tondo, but Raphael brings the figures right forward. They're not even set in a scene anymore. We don't need a landscape. We don't need anything to tell us what's happening. We know what's happening. And the figures are right in the front of the picture plane, almost stepping out at us. She is gazing so directly at us. We can't ignore her. This extraordinary exotic fabrics, the pattern in her, the, this fumato, the softening edges, the dark background, highlighting these figures, um, John the Baptist, the beautiful figure, the fingers intertwining, the support of these arms cuddling into this baby. She's not quite ready to let him go yet. She's holding on tight, this cheek, resting against this young child. And yet the child's toes are twiggling, fiddling with each other. They're ready to move and ready to take off. The only vertical element in this whole piece is this chair. Um, this chair, I'm not gonna go into it now, but it was actually a kind of a birthing chair. And um, it was quite a popular emblem. And it was almost more of the masculine symbol in amongst this image. So now we get um, Pope Julius II. Um, he's in power. He's been in power for a little while. He, I'm now showing you, I'm going, I'm going a little bit out of chronology here, but I wanted to show you this portrait that Raphael does. So Pope Julius II um, asks or really um, insists on Raphael coming to Rome. He's got a big job for him. Bramante, who's Raphael's friend and also, in a way, supporter, you know, kind of has been saying to Julius, you know, you need this young man, you need this young man. He's, he's somebody you need. Um, I'm watching the time and maybe I've got a little bit more time, I hope. Um, so this really portrait of Pope Julius sets a precedent for papal portraiture from then, from 1511 to 12, to this current day. Normally, 
Originally, popes were in full, their full vestments, they were standing, they were performing mass of some description. But we have a pope who sits. He's in his choir robe. He's not performing in, in any kind of a ceremony. He sits quietly in his chair. He's contemplating. He's looking down, which is very unusual. He has this very long beard. He had been ill, and the story goes that his beard had grown while he was ill, but he made a decision to let that beard grow. He was known as the warrior pope, and he just lost the war and lost the territory of Bologna. And he had decided that kind of as a mourning um, symbol, he would grow this beard. Um, I want to show you a bit of a close-up now of what Raphael does with this warrior pope. It's really a, still a, power of, a portrait of power, even though it's a totally different portrait to what we've been used to of popes. Um, so Raphael, again, his amazing detail, here he has his red choir cloak on with, you can see the ermine fur just poking through the lining of the cloak, the beautiful covered buttons, the extraordinary, again, detail in the beard we talked about in the Baldessari portrait, the beautiful papal cap, again, fur lined, this extraordinary pleated silk garment, but we also get these hands coming really forward on the picture plane to show the rings, which represent the red is charity, the white is faith, and of course, the green is hope. Um, the acorn on the papal chair is actually the symbol of Pope Julius's, it's the emblem of his family. So, you know, it's my family, it's my dynasty that has this power. These are portraits that have now, other artists have been influenced by these kind of portraits. This is Velasquez portrait of Pope Innocent X. Um, you know, this sitting in the choir. So here we are now, you know, over 100 years later, 150 years later, and Velasquez is really influenced by Raphael. Raphael. We've got Francis Bacon in 1950s doing this portrait of, the, of, of a pope, this screaming pope, this tormented pope. It's more about Francis Bacon's torment, I might add than it is about anything else. But he, he's um, uh, Francis Bacon's torment with the church, with the Catholic church, with power, with men, um, for a whole lot of other reasons. That's for another time. <laughs> but you can see Raphael's influence goes hundreds of years after his death. And then it's Julius um, who says, I can't stand the decoration that's on in the Vatican, get rid of it. Um, Alexander the Sixth decorations revolting. I can't stand it. I want to purge him out of this place where I live. You know, you buy a house, someone's decorated it in a way you don't like. So you say, I'm putting my touches on it. They're all going. Except he couldn't stand him. And Raphael, of course, is employed to do the um, stanza della segnatura. segnatura. And this is um, the cartoon. So the cartoon is the life-size drawing for the fresco that Raphael was responsible for of the School of Athens. And I want you to notice this extraordinary space here that enables the eye to go up to, of course, our main focus, which is Plato and Aristotle. But Bramante sneaks Raphael, who's painting the Sistine Chapel at exactly the same time as Raphael's been employed by Julius to come and redecorate his rooms. He sneaks him into the Sistine Chapel and Raphael is astounded by what he sees of Michelangelo's ceiling. And within a very short period of time, Raphael adds this character to his School of Athens. And in fact, this figure 
is really a homage to Michelangelo. This is Michelangelo. It's a portrait of Michelangelo in his work clothes, not in his classical ancient Greek, ancient Roman clothes that we see the other characters in. He's alone, he's solo, he's melancholic, he's contemplative. So really Raphael is, has, has admiring his competitor, eight years his senior, but not with disdain. And he actually includes him in the fresco. Julius looks at the fresco, the finished fresco, and says, the figures are alive. He's, he's delighted with what Raphael does. He then sacks all the other artists, and he says to Raphael, you're now going to be responsible for decorating the remainder of my rooms, my private rooms. Um, Julius not long after dies, Leo X ta takes over power at this stage, but he also keeps Raphael on. Um, and so Raphael is now actually responsible for four rooms. So it's not one room, there are four stands there that Raphael is responsible for as well as all of his other commissions. So he's working extraordinarily hard. He has a huge workshop by this stage, has many artists working with him, many apprentices working in his workshop, but he's doing all the designing. So in this room, and the room is known as the fire of the Borgo, in the Borgo, these are the four panels that a lot of people have never seen these rooms and don't go into these rooms. And I'm going to just fairly quickly go through this because I think it's really worthwhile having a look at. So it was a fire, terrible raging fire that occurred in the Borgo. And the Borgo was kind of the suburb or area that abuts the Vatican. So this is the um, Vatican that was under Pope Leo IV. And this is St Peter's here, the old St Peter's, but this is the kind of new Renaissance facade. And this is a, a supposedly, which I'll talk about in a minute, Pope Leo IV. And what he does is he sees that the people in the neighbourhood are in a desperate situation with this extraordinary fire that's destroying their homes. And the Pope comes to the loggia. He was a Benedictine Pope. He recites a Benedictine prayer and the story goes that he extinguishes the fire. What I want to point out is what Raphael does with this extraordinary scene, this dramatic, extraordinary scene. This man who understands human emotion, this man who can convey an interaction between figures, this young man creates this massive fresco that tells us his reference to and knowledge about classical antiquity, but also the role of the church. So the whole scene is flanked by these classical columns. But what he does is the protagonist, who's the Pope, is this tiny little figure in the background and it's the victims who are really in the foreground, put right up against the picture plane. And we are almost standing here, descending the stairs, viewing this chaotic, tragic scene. On the left is Aeneas, so references to classical stories of Aeneas who carries the weight of his father away from this burning village, um, carries the, his heritage and his father's heritage and life on his back, as well as bringing with him his young child. So we've got the father, the past, the son, the present, the child, the future. We have this muscular figure that, of course, is only an influence from Michelangelo, but Raphael understands every muscle and vein and tendon in this body that's clinging from, for life from the edge of the flames as he's trying to jump down into this space, into the void out of the fire. 
we have this figure, as I said to you, who's descending the stairs. And what does she carry? Of course, jugs of water to extinguish the fire. But where are these jugs from? They've been recently dug in the archaeological digs of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, these amphoras. We have this woman turning and twisting in the terrible drama of the flames and the uh, wind that's blowing her. And we know that the energy and the movement and the trauma is being emphasised by these garments. And this woman is in such a hurry. She's sort of ungirdled, barefoot. Her clothes are falling off her as she pushes her children forwards and out of the danger of the flames. The mouths open in horror of the tragedy that they are under um, beholding and, in, and experiencing. And here we are with the Pope still, these beautiful verticals and calmly handing down his blessing on his contemporary loggia, Renaissance loggia, with his followers kind of thanking him and praying to him for saving him. And the last figure I want to point out is this figure who has her back to us, which is also an interesting device. And yet her arms are outstretched in agony and terror. Her hair is blowing. And again, her arm is heading directly up to the Pope. And the Pope's features are not Leo IV, but in fact, Pope Leo X. So here we have the patron being painted, of course, into his artist's um, fresco. Pablo Picasso was totally influenced by Raphael. And now we have pa Pablo Picasso's famous Guernica where the protagonist doesn't even exist. The Luftwaffers who are bombing the city of Guernica, we can't see them. We can't see Franco destroying Guernica. All we see are the innocent victims in the foreground, we see the fire that he got from Raphael. We see the outstretched arms that we, he gets directly from referencing Raphael. And we see these open mouths and the blowing of the hair and the garments, the, the horse's tail um, blowing. We see the open mouths of the screaming mother, the dead warrior, soldier, the horse, all referencing Raphael, this is not an accident. But Pablo Picasso referenced these works of Raphael, the high Renaissance Raphael in his Guernica. And of course, Guernica is now seen as kind of the penultimate painting of the victims of war. Um, and just to kind of get to, I'm going to just skim this quickly. Raphael also was employed by Leo X as an architect, also by Julius, but Leo X as an architect. He uh, designed and built these four-storey loggia. He also decorated them. And these, this was a private passageway for um, the Pope and maybe his guests to move around the um, different rooms in the Vatican. But in fact, this does not belong in the Vatican because Catherine the Great copied, had this copied in the 1780s in her palace in St. Petersburg. He, she um, commissioned this work to be done directly from Raphael's drawings and she has an exact copy. And we can walk into this space. Um, my husband and I have been there. It's the most magnificent space, but you can't go into the ones in the Vatican. So if you want to see Raphael's work, head off to the Hermitage. <laughs> um, tapestries were another extraordinary skill of Raphael's. And um, this was actually a, a cartoon, a drawing for a tapestry that he fully coloured. Um, but <laughs> Raphael actually forgot that when once they're woven, they're in reverse, which is quite amazing considering he was also a huge printmaker. And um, Raimondo was a printmaker who used etching to print many, many, many of Raphael's works and disseminate them. So it was a bit of a strange slip up, but here's the work actually done in tapestry. And um, the tapestry weavers, just kind of out of interest, there are about 6,000 different threads of uh, cotton and silk and wool 
used just for the skin, the flesh tones of all the bodies in all the tapestries. And of course, these tapestries hung below Michelangelo's ceiling, so in the Sistine Chapel, but you can actually see them as you walk past on the walls. This stunning portrait, to me, is the penultimate portrait of Raphael's. Um, the Lady in the Veil. Raphael, unlike the superstars, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, was heterosexual. He had um, an extraordinary love for women. Uh, Vasari says he, he was sleeping around, basically, Vasari says. <laughs> Um, but this woman really took Raphael's heart. Her name was Margarita Luti. She was the son of a Sienese baker. But he paints her in this whole humanist perspective um, as an intelligent, distinguished, uh, exquisite woman of some intellect and some worth. And yet she looks... She, very calm, very relaxed. She's very sensuous. That spreads a tura. She doesn't look down at us. She looks out of us, out at us, almost employing us and inviting us in. It's a very sensual uh, portrait. The stunning fabric on her silk um, sleeves, the folds and the lusciousness with the gold. And in actual fact, in this painting, when they've x-rayed it, underneath she um, actually has on her left hand a ring with a red stone in it that is a commitment stone. And Raphael was madly in love with her. This is known as La uh, Fornarina. She now has been, her clothes have been removed. She has this very sensual uh, transparent cloth that drapes over her body, that nurturing the fingers around the breast, the kind of relationships back to her breastfeeding, uh, Raphael's breastfeeding with his mother, the kind of woman that gives, that nurtures, that gives of herself. But Raphael actually signs Raphael of Urbino around her arm, almost um, kind of as she is my possession, she is mine. It's a commitment of him to her. Raphael, in fact, was betrothed to the niece of a cardinal. He had been betrothed to her for eight, ye eight years. He was reluctantly betrothed to her. He kept delaying it. He kept telling the cardinal, I haven't got time. I'm too busy. I've got so much work on. I haven't got time. Um, and he never actually married her because, of course, Raphael then died at the age of 37. He died with this extraordinary legacy of... Um, over 183 paintings, more than 16 tapestries, those huge tapestries. He was an architect, he was a curator, he was a historian. Um, he really, in a way, I think, succeeded and excelled past that of, in, in many ways, aspects of Leonardo and of Michelangelo. Michelangelo lived for 67 years and completed 182 paintings, be what some of them somewhat rather large. And Leonardo, of course, as we know, completed 15 paintings, although, of course, he was the inventor of extraordinary Renaissance um, thinking. Um, but Raphael really was buried in where, where would he want to be buried? In the most perfect classical building of its time, in the Pantheon. Um, he's buried there. He never married. He took his love with him. And, and Margarita Luti was in fact, um, and I'll just go back to her for a moment, was in fact the inheritor of all of his um, estate. And Picasso says... Leonardo and Michelangelo promised us heaven, but Raphael gave it to us. So I've gone a long time over my time, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I think that Raphael deserves a birthday party, basically. 
after 500 years of maybe being dismissed somewhat. Oh, dear me, dear me, Karen. Ah, a superb presentation. I uh, find it very beautiful. Uh, uh, we have been glued to the screen without exception. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very, very, very much. I just want to make a little point, no point, but just to add a little note. Um, <clears throat> Raphael designed the church of Sant'Eligio degli Orefici a Roma, and, which is the Via Giulia and the Lungo Tevere. I mention this only because my sister got married there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> and I, so, I see that um, there are some people wanting to ask you questions. Uh, please, um, friends, be uh, brief so that uh, Sharon can answer everybody. So who's the first? Everybody's praising you but not asking questions. That's good. <laughs> I may not be able to answer. <laughs> Uh, the decide comes nowhere. I can show to the. It's really fantastic. Uh, we never. There's nothing else. Thank you so much, Sharon. Excellent presentation. Good night, mm -hmm. Bruce Genovese, Emanuela Canini. I have learned a lot of things. Thank you. Uh, fantastic presentation, Galaxy X6. Uh, wonderful presentation. Presentation, Brissima, Brissima, observe that absolutely and full. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Maybe I'm an and, Italian. <laughs> well, you are preparing for it. I'm sure that Mark will uh, train you well. <laughs> And there is always a Dante Alighieri, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, look, uh, if... Uh, and there is somebody says, Dear Sharon, congratulations on the most beautiful presentation. Thank you for your effort. Uh, love, Rocco and Perna. Rocco, uh, Rocco Perna. Uh, is, uh, there is a question by Linda. Is there a biography you would recommend? I'm sure there's more than one. I, I have to say, I know this sounds terrible, but I haven't found one biography that I think was fantastic on Raphael. I think if anybody's really good at writing, okay. it should be written. There are many, some are very old, but they, they're not comprehensive. I think um, this man, Walter Isaacson, needs to do one on Raphael. He's done some yes. extraordinary biographies. Some of you may have read his one on Leonardo. It's, it's unbelievably, beautifully written. But I, I haven't read one, that, uh, one on its own that I could say read it. <laughs> but do read this one <laughs> on Leonardo. <laughs> and uh, there is a, a something for the Dante. Somebody say thank you very much for Bravissima, grazie per il lavoro che fate. Thank you for the good work you do. Well done. Thank you very much. Mm. I... Thank you, Fabio, and thank you, Sharon. I'm sorry, but I can't, I don't know why I type and I can't, it doesn't come up. So thank you, grazie to you all. But don't, don't fear because uh, uh, from tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, this presentation will be on our Dante Alighieri Facebook page. So you can uh, see it, listen to it again, and at your own pace and comfort. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I know that there are people who have asked me whether it was being recorded, and that uh, I am reaffirming and uh, saying this again, yes. And uh, it's a matter of going on the um, uh, website of the Dante Alighieri and look for the YouTube channel. Also, Farron Amanda. Paolo, questa conferenza rimane online, cioè accessibile in futuro oppure no? 
Eh, sì, eh, perlomeno fino a marzo-aprile abbiamo una conferenza ogni mese che sarà online. We are not certain that uh, we are going to be able to do it otherwise. Parlo della conferenza di questa sera. Yes. Grazie. Sì. Eh, Paolo, you can on on the, on the YouTube channel and the, of the website. Ah, c'è ancora, rimane benissimo. Beh, ehm, Gabriele, in his uh, good patience, will take care of this tomorrow or the day after tomorrow when it will become available. Fantastica conferenza. Bene. Cari signori, ringrazio tutti per essere stati con noi. Siete stati più di 40, quindi un complimento e grazie a tutti quanti. Grazie ancora a Sharon, un abbraccio forte, a strong strong uh, congratulations and thank you, thank you very much. So at this point, I think we, this word, we are leaving you all with your thoughts and contemplation. Thank you okay. very much. Bye. Well done. Grazie. Buonasera. Ciao, ciao. Buonasera. Buonasera.